if you go back and watch Star Trek, uh, they don't make meat from animal slaughter on there. They have replicators that just make meat. We no longer enslave animals for food purposes. Hmm? But we have seen humans eat meat. You've seen something as fresh and tasty as meat, but inorganically materialized out of patterns used by our transporters. And it's not just Star Trek. This has been in science fiction for a very long time. The question is, can we turn science fiction into science fact? Can we actually produce meat experiences that can be made inside of a fermenter or a cultivator rather than inside of an animal's body. Hey everyone, in the next few videos, I want to explore precision fermentation meat. That is one of the big investments. Cultivated meat is one of the things that's talked about most in the media. That is the most hype around it, but no one really talks about precision fermentation and how we use those technologies to create better meat. So that's also a combination of plant-based meat and precision fermentation meat. Now, I don't know how long ago I said that I was gonna show a few companies that I went to check out in Hong Kong. I'm gonna do that as well. I really think that if you're investing in alternative proteins, especially cellular, cellular agriculture, you should be looking at plant-based meats. Most people have written it off, but there's a ton of room to grow and that technology is arguably much closer to being at parity and being at scale than cellular agriculture is. So that I want to show the first video of the series, which looks at a company, Better Meat Co, based in Sacramento, California, and they're working on Riza, which is a mushroom root, microprotein, and that's what they use to make their meat. So super cool technology that they have. And this isn't precision fermentation per se, but they do use um, cultivation uh, bioreactors to grow their product as well. I'm splitting this video up in a number of parts. First part is we're looking at a quick clip from a great TED talk by the founder of the Better Meat Co, Paul Shapiro. Second, we're gonna look, get a look into their labs to see what the product looks like and actually how the production process works as well. So with that, let's get into this video. Today, we write messages by tapping on glass screens. But for thousands of years, quill pens like this one were the norm. The Dead Sea Scrolls, the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, all written with quills torn from live geese's bodies. Now, until the 19th century, the literate world required huge numbers of geese in order to keep people writing. And all of these geese were subjected to live plucking that is not that pleasant. And it was very violent, very inhumane. In fact, today's anti-cruelty laws would prohibit it. Yet it wasn't humane sentiment nor sustainability concerns that spared geese from such an undesirable fate. Rather, the invention of the metal fountain pen was good for the goose and good for the gander. With the newfound ability to write sentences uninterrupted by the need to stop and dip your quill into an inkwell and sharpen the quill tip, we now had the ability to continue to write in ways that were so much preferable to the way that we had written before that the metal fountain pen quickly rendered the quill pen a relic of an archaic past. Today, we face yet another opportunity to render a distasteful practice obsolete. And yet again today, it has to do with geese. But the problem is much bigger than geese. The problem today is that we are using vast numbers of geese, ducks, chickens, turkeys, pigs, cows, and other animals who we frankly really like to eat. Now, obviously, this is a big problem for those animals, but it's especially a big problem for us and an even bigger problem for the planet. Because the planet is not getting any bigger. Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself remains the same size. And one of the primary ways that we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. It's no longer a secret that it just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of energy, and a lot of greenhouse gas emissions to raise and slaughter billions of animals for food compared to just eating plants directly. Using animals for food is the number one driver of deforestation, the number one driver of wildlife extinction, and a whole host of other environmental crises that we face today. 
As just one example, consider the fact that animal agriculture contributes more greenhouse gas emissions than the entirety of the transportation sector combined. Let that sink in. Now, of course, we all know that it would be better for us to enjoy more plant-based meals and eat fewer animals. That would be great. Unfortunately, that's not what's happening. What's happening is the meat demand is going up, not down. It's going up because, yes, we are adding more people to the planet, which of course increases total demand, but it's especially going up because, on a per-person basis, we are eating more meat today than we ever have been in all of human history prior. It would be wonderful if we wanted to enjoy more lentil soup and rice and bean burritos and hummus wraps. These are great foods. I wish we would eat more of them. But I also wish people would walk and bike more, yet people seem to really want to drive. So we need to make cars that don't rely on fossil fuels. Similarly, people seem to really want to eat meat. So we must find ways to recreate the meat experience without animals. Just in the same way that the metal fountain pen allowed us to continue writing, but in a way that was much more efficient than we had written for millennia prior, the task before humanity today must be to find ways to continue to allow ourselves to enjoy the experience of eating meat, but in a way that uses way less land, way less water, way fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and of course, in a way that doesn't harm animals. That is how we can efficiently enjoy the meat experience. Well, good news. There are many ways to recreate meat, just as there are many ways to get energy without fossil fuels. Think wind, solar, geothermal, nuclear, and more. Well, there's lots of ways to recreate the meat experience without animals. Already, many companies are turning plant proteins into things that look like animal meat and that taste like animal meat, and these are great. These plant-based meats aren't fake meat any more than a metal fountain pen is a fake quill. It's just a new way to enjoy the meat experience. But there are some limitations to using plant proteins, mainly because plants and animals are really far away from one another on the tree of life. So you need to do a lot to plants to make them look and taste like animals. So some companies instead are just cultivating actual animal cells and growing animal meat without the animals. This field is sometimes referred to as cultivated meat or clean meat, and it is awesome. It's such a cool technology. Unfortunately, it is still many years away from being able to sell this stuff on fast food menus or big box grocery store shelves, which is of course the type of scale that is needed in order to make a dent in the problem that we are trying to solve. But there is a third way, and yes, I am talking about the F word. Fungi, of course, but not just any fungi. We're not talking here about mushrooms. We're talking about microscopic fungi, sometimes referred to as mycelium, that, as you can see here at a 40x magnification, doesn't look like a mushroom at all because it's not. Rather, as you can see here, we've dyed the fungi red, and what's been dyed purple is actually byproducts from a french fry processing facility. Now, I'll explain in a minute why this is so important, but for now, just know that the fungi is eating the potatoes. Now, we'll go back to grade school biology class for a moment here and remind ourselves that, yes, there are the kingdoms of plant and animal, but there's also another kingdom, the fantastic world of fungi. And interestingly enough, fungi and animals are way closer to one another than either is to plants. Interestingly, many cultures have been using mushrooms as a meat alternative for many centuries because many species of mushrooms have a far more meat-like texture than do plants, that the plants typically do. Now, again, though, we're not talking about mushrooms, we are talking about mycelium, the filamental, root-like structure that carpets much of the earth that is made of fungi. And fortuitously, there are many species of fungi whose flesh, so to speak, is already textured like animal flesh, and it's packed with protein, zinc, iron, and other nutrients that we typically associate with animal-based meat. So we'll go back to our friendly fungi that's been magnified 40x, and I want to show you what this looks like and why it's important if we go a little bit deeper. So I'm going to show you what it looks like at 100x, just so you can get a sense of what's actually happening and why it's important. So as you can see, when you go here, what's happening is that we can feed the byproducts of the agricultural industry, like corn, potato, and rice, two microscopic fungi who turn it into mycelium that on its own, in its natural whole food, unprocessed state, already has the texture of meat and the nutritional qualities of meat that we are seeking. And the result is frankly amazing.
Let me show you some of the applications that we can make from this mycelium at my startup, The Better Meat Co. For example, we can make a succulent chicken breast made from mycelium without the chicken, or a delicious turkey deli slice sandwich without the turkey, or a steak that can satisfy even the most inveterate carnivore. And yes, for our friends in the geese community who are happy to be keeping their quills because we no longer need them, they too can now keep their livers because we can make a microbial delectable foie gras that will satisfy even the most stingy gourmand. In other words, by using fungi to replace animal-based meat, we can allow ourselves to continue enjoying the experience of meat consumption, but in a way that takes far fewer resources. And importantly, we can grow this type of product in stainless steel tanks that resemble craft breweries, except instead of brewing alcohol, we are brewing protein. And unlike a cow who needs more than a year of feeding before you get a steak, we can harvest our little microbial fungi in less than one single day. Today I'm just gonna kind of show you some of the stuff that we do in the lab, a little bit about our process. Um, so as you see here, this big jug is full of a, uh, our, basically what comes out of our bioreactor. Um, it kind of looks a little bit like applesauce. It's just a filamentous fungus. And um, when we process this, um, you know, a lot of meat replacement products require a lot of processing and extrusion and things like that to get a texture that is similar to meat. But what you'll see here is that through a very simple process, we can take this, we can remove the liquid. It's like straining cheese. <laughs> it is like straining cheese, yeah. All right, and so then we get something that looks like this. And so you can see if we tear that apart, that just has a texture that's kind of like tuna or mm. chicken or this like kind of these long fibrous structures. And I'm, I'm sure as you can appreciate, um, fungi uh, are very interesting because they have a structure very similar to uh, muscle cells. So uh, skeletal muscle are these uh, long fibrous cells that have many nuclei in them and fungi are exactly the same way. In fact, if you look at them under the microscope, as you can see here, um, here I have a strain where there are uh, nuclei uh, that have been stained with a green fluorescent protein. And you can see uh, this kind of very busy network. And these are all nuclei moving around in a shared oh, cytoplasm. Wow. And so uh, because of these long cells, uh, we are able to minimally process these. We're able to, when we go through our whole process, uh, we're able to pack them so that they have a structure that is very similar to meat because at the cellular level, they are very similar to meat. Um, and I think they're just like really cool to look at. Here we have septins that are stained and you could see those nuclei that were just flowing through the cells. And one thing that's very interesting about fungi is they have these little pores like this and uh, everything kind of gets squeezed through these little pores. So these are excellent uh, organisms at uh, performing biochemistry in somewhat like unimaginable circumstances. So they're chock full of protein. Uh, they're full of, uh, we have uh, really great vitamins and minerals and everything that you know you would really need. We've done nutritional analysis on these and uh, they actually have uh, more protein than eggs, um, mm -hmm. more fiber than sweet potatoes, uh, or actually more potassium than sweet potatoes. They have more fiber than oats and then they have more iron than beef. Um, and that is per the um, reference amounts customarily consumed, which the USCA uses for labeling. So can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. So the stats that you just listed off, was that, I guess, on purpose uh, to kind of appease like a certain type of consumer? Because obviously, you know, in American society, you know, we just want to have more protein, protein, protein. Or did it just naturally um, just produce this kind of nutritional profile. Yeah, so that is actually just naturally how it is. Uh, I just started working here about four months ago and I uh, was hired basically to kind of optimize these things and see if we can improve strains, if we can make strains that have more protein, more fiber, more, you know, if we want to produce certain vitamins or things like that. Um, but this is just in, in its natural state. And so I think that there's a real opportunity here to even think outside of 
meat alternatives, but to really think of this as a whole food. I mean, we've been eating uh, in our food system fungi since time immemorial. I mean, we eat fermented foods that have fungi in them. We eat mushrooms. We eat all kinds of things. And these are, uh, there's no reason that we shouldn't be eating mycelium. Yeah. And mycelium is a really great source of these nutrients, as I listed uh, for you, just in its natural state. And so I think there's a real opportunity here, like I said before, not to just think about meat alternatives, but to really kind of think about a new category of a nutritious food source that can provide us, you know, protein, fiber, uh, no cholesterol, because fungi don't make cholesterol, um, and very, very low fat. Um, so in terms of meat, uh, we do know through from the science that it produces a lot of um, inflammatory, uh, you know, mediators, markers, it, you know, sets off the body to a whole host of, I guess, uh, I like to call the rusting process, you know, for a car when I, you know, whenever I, you know, talk to my patients, does the mycelium or the fungi, um, you know, do, do any of that, especially through the process that you put it through? No, actually. And it's really interesting that you brought that up because we're in the process of publishing a, a paper in which we reviewed um, all of the kind of animal studies that have been done where animals have been fed uh, the, this particular species of fungus. And actually what they found were that dietary fiber, polysaccharides from the cell wall of these fungi in mice that had been uh, where they had had uh, inf like uh, basically inflammatory bowel disease induced in mm. them. Um, by feeding them this fiber, it was actually able to reverse that by selecting for uh, good gut bacteria. And it actually, uh, there was some upregulation of anti-inflammatory cytokines. Nice. And so, um, yeah, there's some really good evidence out there that um, fungal uh, fiber is actually very good for animals in general. So suffice to say that it, it's very, very good for the microbiome. Yes, yes. And actually another... Um, Another aspect is that I read a study in a, in a different species, but they found that the iron was um, highly bioavailable, actually. Mm. It was um, just as, it was actually more bioavailable than the um, like best supplements on the market, um, right. as far as, I, I, I forget which form of iron is best, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you don't have to inject yourself with any like vitamin C to make it more bioavailable, right. right? Yeah, and actually it was also really interesting because you didn't get like a rush of iron from it like you do from taking a supplement. It was uh, kind of like more slowly released because it was kind of coming into your system mm -hmm. as the food was digested because those that, that cell wall is very tough. It's a defense mechanism for the fungus. So as your digestive system breaks that down, you know, you are releasing the cellular contents, you know, which provide you with the, you know, protein and the fiber and the iron and everything else. Nice. Right. So this is um, the first part of our facility. It's a really important part because in this area, is where we prepare the media or the food that we're gonna give to our organism. So if we walk over this way, we keep all of our ingredients. It's nice and hot. Yes, yeah, nice and warm <laughs> in here, definitely. Uh, we use a thermal process to uh, sterilize all of our you know, media. Uh, make sure that no bacteria or anything we don't want in there gets, it gets in there. So this area right here, um, as I said, is a media preparation area. It's very highly automated, and this is basically where we create the food for the organism. And so um, we sterilize everything, make sure you know any bugs or anything are out, um, and then we store that media in these big tanks back here. Uh, they're called media tanks, and so we kind of store them there until we're ready to introduce it to the organism and let it grow. So that's where all of this happens. It's a really important step. And how fast um, does it uh, take uh, to be able to, to go through the, the entire process? Well, right now, um, you know, we're just doing R&D. And so uh, the whole process is, you know, what's called a batch process. So basically we prepare the media, we feed the organism, and in less than 24 hours, our organism actually grows and is ready for us to harvest. So it's a really efficient process. Um, but the intention is to go continuous and so to run it at all times. Um, but right now our organism takes less than a day to actually grow and create the food that we then package up and sell to big companies to use as a, as a basis for their meat. If, you, if the fermentation process goes beyond 24 hours, is, is there any like side effects? Is it, 
does the is it better um, more than 24 hours or you guys just found that 24 hours is, is a good sweet spot um the the timing is just shows the efficiency of the organism the organism doesn't need any more time to take nutrients and turn them into protein so it's actually you know the shorter the better because you're more efficient it doesn't really need any more time to grow so that's what's great about this organism and um, in terms of energy input, you know, um, in modern agriculture, we use a lot of water, right? Uh, use a lot of land, use up a lot of grains and crops to feed the livestock. How much input, um, what kind of input and how much more or less compared to modern agriculture um, for this process? It's significantly less. I mean, if you think about it, most plant-based meats or, you know, products that are out on the market use isolates, plant isolates. So you, let's just take pea, for example. To grow, to make pea protein, you have to basically, you know, take the whole land, harvest the protein, or harvest the pea, excuse me. Then you take the pea, you strip it of everything except for the protein. You take out everything else except for the protein. Then you have to mill it into a powder. Then you have to extrude it so that it has texture. All of that takes a significant amount of resources to do. Uh, our process, we're not doing that. We're basically taking actually byproducts from, the agri from agricultural waste. We're feeding it to our organism. In less than 24 hours, it can grow. We harvest it and we package it. It's, a, it's an incredibly less amount of yeah. resources that it uses. Yeah, yeah our seed reactor which is basically the reactor that we use to grow our, our mycelium at the beginning of the process so we introduce the organism here we feed it a little bit of the media and then it grows a little bit and this sight glass allows us to see how it's doing how it's growing um, and so we leave it here for overnight and then once it's ready and it has grown enough, then we introduce it to the larger reactor. And then that's when the process starts of, you know, less than 24 hours and then we harvest it. This is what Ryza looks like in its finished form. So after it's been in the reactor, all we do is we dewater it, we chop it up in little pieces and then we dry it, we deactivate the organism. It is a living organism, so we have to deactivate it so it doesn't continue to grow. And then we package it up in these vacuum sealed bags, which now is, you know, shelf stable, doesn't require any type of cold chain, refrigerated truck or anything like that. Makes it a lot cheaper to transport, a lot easier to handle. And then this is how it gets to our customers. All they have to do is take it out of here, rehydrate it, and then off they go. And they can use it as like, just basically a main product for whatever they want to turn it into. That's right. It can be used. They can make their own plant-based meat out of this. They can blend it with other meat. Ground meat works really well. And um, actually, the riser really soaks up that moisture from the meat really well. Um, and yeah, it can really be turned into anything, as you saw. So these are actually, this is Ryza, but in just much smaller granules. And this can also be used for products like foie gras or, or really anything else. But this works better for something that's going to be more of a cream or mm. something like that, whereas this uh, works better for the actual texture, you know, the meatiness that you right. are looking for. So this is actually a picture of our organism over here eating some potato. And that wow. potato has been, this has all been dyed. and this, Stained, yeah. Yeah, so this is, uh, this purple area is the potato and you can actively see our organism eating that, which is mm -hmm. really exciting. And then down here is kind of the end product, right? Is we're able to make something like a chicken breast and hopefully Ryza will be able to save the planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Question is um, how, d you know, why potatoes and not other types of, uh, is, did you find that potatoes would be like the best source ingredients? Uh, the organism is actually really incredible in that it can t it can eat things like potatoes, which are you know high starch, um, but it can also eat corn byproducts as well. So all it really needs is a good source of nitrogen and carbon, and then it turns that into protein. Mm -hmm. Where this organism is found the most is uh, in uh, burnt forests, and actually one of the really cool things is that. Um, the spores that are formed through reproduction uh, are activated by heat. 
And so uh, fungi are, you know, if it weren't for fungi, you know, the earth would just be piled up with leaf litter and things like that. And so uh, they're, they're actually always excreting these um, cellulases and like different enzymes that break down um, uh, various plant matter and things like that. So there's a really just versatile range of um, different plant materials that we could use um, yeah. for a food source, which yeah, for using, uh, you know, food waste products, like, you know, just like, you know, byproducts from corn processing or, you know, any kind of plant processing, you know, yeah. it's a great way to upcycle those things. So one of the really great things about our organism that we work with is it is, uh, it doesn't make any mycotoxins. Um, there are no, we know, we, and, and actually this organism was the first organism used to study molecular genetics. Um, and then because it was easier to do in yeast and things like that, those kind of eclipsed it. But, you know, we know more about this particular species of fungus as a, just as a fungal organism. It's not a human pathogen. It's not, you know, there, there is no way that it can make people sick. So mm -hmm. it's just inherently, safe mm -hmm. um, to consume and so I think because we know so much about it um, because there are so many uh, people have looked at it in so many different ways we found so many different natural variants of the species there are lots of things that we can play around with with like how different strains uh, produce different nutrients how different strains affect the texture of the final product so uh, if you want to learn more information about our company or reach out, ask any questions, we always welcome hearing from anybody. Um, so our website is www.bettermeat.co. Um, and then also we do tastings. So if you're in the area or live anywhere around here, we do public tastings and we love to get people's feedback on our food. Um, so please sign up. You can do that through our website. Um, and yeah, just reach out anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got to try the... Rise of Microprotein Turkey Deli Slices last October, I believe it was. They're delicious. Really tastes the closest to a turkey deli slice that I've ever tasted of any of the other plant-based, well, non-animal foods. One thing to note as well, you can't actually buy products from this company as a consumer. They're B2B business, so they sell products directly to businesses who then turn their rise of microprotein into their own plant-based meat products or blended meat products. But you can do tastings. Recommend if you live in the Sacramento area or are going to California, you go check them out. Again, check out both of those videos in the description. I'm Chris, this is Space Foods. We'll catch you in the next video.